morning everybody. Everybody enjoying the rain? The little bit that we've had so far. Okay. As you can see, we've got a little bit of power this morning. Uh, enjoy it while you can. We're not going to have it for long. <laughs> okay. Um, I have no announcements. Uh, except it's nice to see Rupert here this morning. We need two echoes. Uh, Sonia was on the of your work today. And Tracy, it's nice to see you again. Here with Brooklyn. Uh, we have got no birthdays, we've got no anniversaries, we have got anything else coming up. Alright, does anybody have any announcements? No other announcements. Alright, that was a very, very short. Up to date. Sorry? I'll, I'll, I'll have to talk to the person doing the slides is slipping up. Right? I'll have to talk, to, give them a serious talking to. You know, it's so difficult getting decent help nowadays. You know? Either they're competent, but they cost too much, or they're incompetent, they can't do the job. Yeah? You know? Oh, you just got rid. No other announcements. Alright, if there are no other announcements, let us then open with a word of prayer. <laughs> Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we are grateful once again to be able to assemble at this place on the first day of the week that you have given to us again. We thank you for the rain and the cloudiness that we have outside, Father, bringing nourishment once again to the earth. Father, the many blessings that you bestow on us and all the good things that you give to us. Father, we are always grateful that we are able to assemble together like this. Father, that we can encourage one another just by seeing one another, by talking to one another, greeting one another. So, Father, we are truly blessed to be able to gather in this place. We think of those as always, amongst the number that are sick, we think of Esmeralda and the continual struggle that she faces. We think of Auntie Lynn and the trouble with her back. Lord, we are grateful that Tracy has managed to find alternate accommodation. But we constantly, we still think of her father for, in her quest, looking for employment. And also for Lynn looking for accommodation at this time. Lord, we know that we can and we are able to bring all of these things before you, knowing that you care for each and every one of us. And Father, we thank you for everyone that is present here this morning. We thank of those that could not be with us on this, on this first of the week. We ask you to be with them, to restore them to us at the next time. Father, be with us in our worship to you this morning, that everything may be acceptable in your sight. And this is our prayer with thanksgiving, and in Jesus' name, Amen. Some
is that the blood of Jesus is life-giving. In Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 it says, For the life of the body is in its blood. I have given you the blood of the altar to purify you, making you right with God. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. Remember that God's justice demands that the sinner die for his sins. That is what God's righteousness demands. But yet in God's grace, He sent someone else to pay the price. And that is what we are looking at in our study of Matthew. Jesus, born of a virgin, born of the Holy Spirit, holy man, but also holy God. When you donate blood, you are literally giving a part of yourself to give life to someone else. That is how important blood is. <clears throat> the sacrifice you make of the temporary pain and loss provides a greater gain for another. Remember someone involved in a surgery or a car accident, the amount of blood that they require. And if that blood is not available, that person will die. If a person has no blood running through their veins, that person is dead, has no life. <coughs> There is no greater drive on this earth than a blood drive. For in that, people are able to give life to others that need it. The blood of Jesus was necessary. Pure, perfect blood was a requirement to reconcile us back to God. Nothing else can reconcile us to God. Not the blood of animals. Through hundreds of years, through thousands of years of Jewish history, all of that bloodshed could never reconcile anyone to God. We don't often like to think about sin and the devastation that it brings between us and God, the separation that is caused between us and God. Blood sacrifices had to be paid on behalf of the sins of the people. Every day, the priests had to sacrifice and make sacrifices on behalf of a person who came to them. Again, shedding of blood to remind them of the sin that they had committed. We are blessed because we are on the other side of the cross. We are and we need no longer any sacrifices. No sacrifices of animals are required anymore because Jesus paid that price. Jesus' blood covered all sins in one divine moment. Colossians 1.20 and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, are making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And then thirdly, the blood of Jesus gives us freedom. Revelation 1 verse 5. <clears throat> and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us, from our sins by his blood. We all had a death sentence over us. We were trapped in our sins by Satan, by his deception and his luring ways. Jesus, when he died on the cross, 
set us free and he gave us freedom from that. And then finally the blood of Jesus was perfect. In order for Jesus' blood to make a difference, he needed to be perfect. And that is why, as Robert said this morning, salvation could not come from inside humanity itself. Because the writer, Paul, the writer of Romans, tells us there's none righteous. No, not one. So God had to reach in from outside humanity and give us a way of salvation. Jesus' perfection as the perfect man and also as God holy himself was able to be the perfect sacrifice. The sacrifices in the Old Testament always had to be a male lamb or a goat without defect. Jesus Christ was perfect when he walked on this earth and when he died on the cross. Let us give thanks for the bread this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather around your table, we are grateful for the sacrifice that your Son was willing to make. Father, as we are always reminded that without the shedding of blood there can be no forgiveness of sins. Father, that you reached into humanity, you gave of yourself, you gave us your Son, the only, your only one Son, Father, you gave us to die. Father, the perfect sacrifice shed once for all time. Father, there is no further need of any sacrifices. What your Son did on the cross was once forever, Father, reaching back as far back as the creation of the world and going forward as far as the world will still be here. And Father, we thank you for the sacrifice that you were willing to make and that your son was willing to make when he died on the cross. For this bread that symbolizes his body that was lifted up on the cross. And we ask a blessing upon each one partaking with it this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, in like manner we come before you, giving thanks for the fruit of the vine, symbolizing the blood of your Son that flowed from the cross of Calvary. Father, for, the, for his own life that he was willing to give in our stead. Father, for the love that you had for this world, for mankind, that you were willing to send your Son to die for us. And Father, again, we ask a blessing upon each one partaking, partaking of it this morning. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
We can learn from the Bible that not all churches are prepared to grow in number or in spirit. For instance, notice what is said about the church at Laodicea. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot, cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have no need of anything. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. <coughs> this church at Laodicea had reached the point where it doesn't do anything. It doesn't grow. It doesn't do anything. It was a church just going through the motions. And it is very sad when a congregation reaches a state because nothing will get done and the church will end up dying instead of growing. Christians should never allow themselves to become lukewarm. We need to be aware for a church to grow. It must be evangelistic. But evangelism alone will not cause a church to grow. Once we have reached out to the lost, we get them here. We need to keep them here. And I think we all know that all new converts are on fire. They are on fire for a while. But then, they can quickly fade away to be never seen again. And unless a congregation is prepared to assimilate and nurture new converts, any success we have in evangelism may be short-lived. In order for us to have growth that will last, we must get ready to grow. This means we must grow as a congregation but also individually. What I'd like us to do this morning is look at several suggestions and what is involved in getting a congregation to grow and also to grow as individuals. Firstly, <coughs> assemblies that edify are important. The reason why this is important because our assembly is oftentimes the first point that someone will have contact with the church and the gospel. We need to evaluate ourselves and our congregations at times. We need to observe how our congregation treats visitors. What does a visitor see and hear? when they come to this congregation? Do they see a loving congregation or do they see a cold-hearted one? As you, we evaluate ourselves and our congregation, look and see how many people talk and greet the visitors. All of these things are important for a church and a congregation to grow. Because if the visitor cannot see the love that we have not only for one another, but also for them, then they will not feel welcome. 
Jesus thought this a very important lesson that we show our love as Christians. In John chapter 13, verses 34, 35. And he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you. How much did Jesus love us? He loved us enough to die for us. That you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And this also applies to those that have been recently converted. New converts need a lot of encouragement. And we as a congregation need to show that we love them and support them as they grow spiritually. New converts are usually excited about Christianity. They will attend all the services, all the Bible studies, because they are so anxious to grow. And many times they will become discouraged because they see that not everybody feels the same way. They begin to observe that many do not attend all the services. And this is just one of the reasons why it is important for us to try and attend every service. So that if possibly we can become and we be encouragers to, the, to one another. Another thing we must consider if we are serious about growing has to do with those who lead our assemblies. Those who lead, who have any role in the worship service, must take that role seriously. This means we need to be prepared to serve our role, to do so gladly and with enthusiasm. We should never have a half-hearted attitude when we lead prayer, when we teach, when we pray, when we preach or when we sing. What kind of impression does it leave with visitors if we appear to be bored with what we are doing? And this also applies to every member. We should all be excited about being here. Psalms 122 verse 1 says, I was glad when they said, come, let us go up to the house of the Lord. There are several things we can do to show our enthusiasm for the church. <clears throat> One of them is we can arrive early to greet the visitors and to talk with other members. It is understandable that from time to time we may be late for services due to circumstances beyond our control. But being consistently late does not create a good impression and may appear to new converts that we are not excited about being here and worshiping God. Another thing that we can do to show our enthusiasm <coughs> is to participate wholeheartedly in the singing, in prayers and paying attention to the reading of God's Word. And then finally we can show love for God's people by staying around and visiting, having a cup of coffee, having a biscuit, instead of rushing for the door and saying, I've done my bit for God for the day. Another thing that we can do to get ready to grow is to make sure we assimilate and nurture new members. We need to realize that any newcomer at first feels like an outsider. They are going to be searching for a place where they can fit in. And it is important that we as a congregation make them feel as if they are part of the family. I want you to think back 
just for a moment to the time when you became a Christian. And the first time that you attended a service as a Christian, were you made to feel welcome? Or did you feel like an outsider? That you are just a visitor visiting with them? Or did they make you feel part of the family? At first, they give a lot of attention to a newcomer for the first two, three weeks, the first month or so. People are coming up to you, talking to you, telling how proud they are of you, of becoming a Christian, of taking that important step. And then all of a sudden they stop talking to you. Nobody greets you anymore. Everybody goes and huddles in their group. And all that you get after that is just an occasional, Hi, how are you? Do you think that someone will feel welcome? Do you feel someone like that will stay? And remain a faithful Christian for long? And the chances are most probably not. That is important why we need to make everybody feel included. <clears throat> Talk to everybody, especially the visitors, the new convert, converts. Make them feel at home, a member of God's family. Many times new converts had a, have a lot of problems to deal with. And mature Christians need to be there to help them. In Romans chapter 15, Paul says the following, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ does not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. If we don't make time for new members, they may soon wither away. But what does it take for a congregation to provide such things? It begins with us as an individual, as part of the congregation, working together in unity, showing our strength and our ability to grow. Because it all depends on what each member is willing to give. <coughs> To look at that we as individuals need in order to get ready to grow. And I think the most important thing is we need to strengthen our relationship with God. In our lesson last week on encouragement, Paul and Jesus got, in his, got his encouragement not from men, because men can fail you. The encouragement that he got was from God. God can never fail us. And that is so important that we have a relationship and a close relationship with God. Because the more and the closer we are to God, the more people will be able to see God in us. It is not enough for us just to know the Lord. We need to live for the Lord. When we do this, we can truly share God's blessings with those around us. We also need to remember that no matter how strong of a relationship we think we have with God, there is always a place for improvement. We are always there is always place to grow. And Paul understood this in Philippians chapter 3. And he says, not that I have already obtained or am already perfected, 
But I press on that I may know, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press forward or toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this in mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Paul is not just talking to the new convert. Paul is also talking to the mature members. To have the same attitude that he himself had. That there is always room for improvement in our relationship with God. Peter also speaks of the need as an individual to grow. And this is probably one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. And that is 2 Peter chapter 1. And he says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence at your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance. To perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> we can think of these as stairs. As steps that we can take in our growth as Christians. As soon as we are on the first step and we have a solid footing there, we can go on to the next step. There is a great need for each of us to grow, no matter how strong we think we are as Christians. Our spiritual growth will blossom if we take time each day to study and read God's Word, to spend time <clears throat> with Him in prayer. Remember, if you would, how Jesus rejuvenated Himself. He would spend time with the Father in prayer. Psalms chapter 1, 1 to 3. The writer says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that brings forth its fruit in, in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. We also, when we make an effort to grow, need to make an effort to attend all assemblies of the saints as we are commanded by the writer of Hebrews to do. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And I like the first part of this word verse, in order to stir up love and good works. And how do we do that? By not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner or the habit of some, but exhorting <coughs> one another, and so much more, as you see the day approaching. Another thing we can do to get ready to grow is to strengthen our relationship with one another. And the reason why this is so important is because our brotherly love and our unity is a powerful example for Christ. Jesus said that those around us will know that we are Christians if we have love for one another. A strong network of loving Christians is essential in assimilating and nurturing new Christians. 
We also need to remember that no matter how strong our relationship with one another is, or we think it is, there is always room to improve our relationships. <clears throat> Paul taught this to the Thessalonians when he says to them, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. This means we should seek every opportunity that we are able to strengthen our bond in Christ. This can be done by attending and assembling with the saints, getting involved with various activities of the brethren. We can also increase this bond by a simple act of hospitality, inviting someone to your home or accepting the invitation to theirs. Another thing that we need to do as individuals is to build and develop a relationship with the lost. This is very important unless we reach out to the lost, we will never grow. We will never be able to let our light shine in the darkness of a sinner's life. Jesus says in Matthew 5, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in darkness. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. How can anyone be led to the light unless we can show it to them? The Jews had an idea, and that idea was to turn their backs on sinners. But Jesus' idea was totally different to the norm of the day. And he says in Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus sat at the house, or sat in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And since we are to follow Jesus' example, it is imperative that we develop relationships with the lost, and in so doing, let our light shine before men. We should never have the attitude that we only love and care for the brethren and for those that are exactly like us. Because again, in Matthew, Jesus says in Matthew 5, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. So in order to grow, we must be willing to love more than just our family and our friends. And developing relationships is an ongoing process. But if we see that a person is not interested in what we have to say, is not interested in the gospel and in the good news of Jesus, then it is time to move on to another. This is the concept that Jesus taught his disciples when he sent them out from city to city, preaching that the kingdom of God was at hand. And he says in Matthew 10, 
Now, whatever your town you enter, inquire who in it, in it is worthy, and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust of your, from your feet. So Jesus is teaching us not to limit ourselves just to one person. To avoid those who are unwilling to listen to us and to hear us. Who are unwilling to and are avoiding the word of God. Instead we need to reach out to those who are receptive instead. You remember how Paul did this. Paul went to the Jews first. And when the Jews started to oppress him and fight him at every corner, Paul said to them, fine, then I will go to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles would listen to him. So some of the things that we could do to show the lost that we care for them and their soul is showing them hospitality by inviting them to us or invite or accepting invitation from them. It is important that we invite them to worship, giving them an opportunity to meet other loving Christians. We have seen in this lesson this morning that if we are to grow, we have to be ready and willing, not only as an individual, but also as a congregation. Notice what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Paul is telling us that if we're willing to be useful to God, we must be willing and able to serve Him. Remember the lesson of a few weeks ago? Ready, willing and able. Many times Many people are ready, but they are not willing. And then you have those that are willing, but not able. We as Christians need to be all three. Ready, <coughs> willing, and able to serve the Lord. To pain and plan
machtige kone, en die vir Heere God wat in die jimmel is, die God wat op die troon Heers en regeer oor allemaal en alles. As die kerk kom ons vermiddag na die toe weer die seen, ons liewe Jesus Christus. We praise you Lord, we worship you, you are God Almighty, you are the great I am, and you are so good to us. We say thank you that we are able to come up to the house of the Lord. We are indeed glad and it was good to be here. Through the Psalms, we flew away. You walked with us in the garden. You whispered hope to us as we're on our way to Canaan's land. At the table, you reinstated the power that is in the blood of Jesus. And at the message, all oh, we acknowledge the council in those areas where we are still cold, lukewarm. Help us to find encouragement and we search within ourselves what we need to do. This afternoon as a church, we want to echo the words of your anointed King David, creating me a pure heart of God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Please do not take and cast me from your presence and take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore in me the salvation and the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit on this pilgrim journey, Lord, because David says that will sustain me. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.